afternoon. Uh, welcome to the second Emancipatory Futures Practitioner Talk. Uh, the Emancipatory Futures Project is a new knowledge project at Wits University. And it's really about trying to build up a body of knowledge uh, around how we survive the heating world. And it has a broad research agenda and thrust, ranging from understanding the temporalities of climate change and how it changes our society, so seasonality is changing, as we know. It's about decolonizing futures, it's about utopia, dystopia, it's about um, grand ecocentric futures, and it's about the role of futures in history. So, the last time we were in this space, we had a practitioner from rural South Africa, Mazibuko Jaha, who helped us understand how a new movement is being built in rural communities in this country. And it's a new kind of movement. It's a transformative movement. It's trying to build an alternative economy, a solidarity economy. It's trying to build um, an alternative food economy, food sovereignty economy, if you like. And it's really trying to do this in a way that hasn't been done before. Today our input comes from uh, two very, very important practitioners uh, from the Western Cape, particularly Cape Town, the Philippi Horticultural uh, Campaign. Uh, we have with us uh, Nazir Ahmed Sonde, who's the chairperson of this campaign. And this campaign has been around for about 10 years or more, I think, Nazir. And it's really about pushing back against the attack from the city of Cape Town. The Philippine horticultural area is a food hotspot in the city of Cape Town. It's been around for a very long time, we'll hear about this history. But uh, the city of Cape Town has other plans. And it is not just about stealing this land and dispossessing the farmers there. It's also about stealing the biodiversity, about stealing the water commons that's there, and so on and so on. So this is a major flashpoint in South African politics, in food politics. And so we have Nazir um, as one of the key players uh, to share with us what's happened in the struggle. Uh, and he's also a farmer, and he's been pioneering uh, farming for, for a very long time, and I'll say something about that just now. We also have accompanying him, Susan Coleman, and Susan also has been engaged in the struggle for many years. Uh, she's a health optometrist, but she's also a lay lawyer. She's been learning in the struggle, uh, mastering how to use Amateur. law. Amateur. Amateur lawyer, uh, but you know, using lawfare against the other side, which is really amazing. But uh, both our guests have also done something else. They've spent the past few days with us setting up a gardening site at the Sunnyside um, student residence. And they've done this in an amazing way. Uh, they've helped us understand the gospel five truths of <coughs> agroecology uh, and, and other practices. So it's been an amazing journey with them so far. Lots of students have been part of this process. Lots of uh, community gardeners and farmers have been part of this process. Uh, and if you are interested, uh, Nazir will probably will say more, but tomorrow is the exciting day. We're planting uh, all the trees, etc. So please try and come. So I'm going to stop there and I'm going to hand over to the both of you. Uh, yeah, you have about 30 minutes between you. Okay. Thanks, Vish. And Courtney and everybody who got us up here, Ricky. You're welcome. There's a, um, there's a nice continuity to your, your series of practitioner talks. I was at school with Mazibu I have to say, I was the senior. You said that. You said that. <laughs> uh, I'm from King Williamstown. For my sins, I moved to Cape Town and then said something really foolish to Nazir about four years ago. I said, I'm, I'm doing my master's, I can do research, let me help. And that was the end of that. <laughs> so I got involved in the, in, the, in the PHA campaign, as it's now known. Um, about four years ago, my, my passion for the land comes from my father, who's um, always been in rural development, and he retired out, out of the Department of Land Reform. And so you'll see that the, the, the cause is not just centered around land and agrarian reform, it's also very close to home. It's now become a sexy topic in the last year of land reform. Um, and so this area of 3,000 hectares, that yellow area in, uh, the, in, on the Cape Flats, has been the city's breadbasket for 130 years. And um, 
What we thought we'd do is show you the, a video of who we are quickly first. It's got subtitles. And that'll give you more of a picture of the area because I want, you, I want you to see the extent of the area. The water that you see feeding the, um, the crops is actually the aquifer beneath the land. Oh, is it slow motion? Help?
and then the politicians and the developers are looking at short-term gains while we are we'll be losing a long-term benefits that this area holds for the city and every single citizen in the city. So my colleague is taking no responsibility for the beginning of this talk because he's been on his feet all day. So he reckons he dug a whole lot more than I did, so I get to stand up first. Um, the Philippi Horticultural Area um, provides 200,000 tons of vegetables a year to the city. It's almost half of most of the, the vegetable types that are provided to citizens in the city. At the moment, um, the, it's employing 6,000 workers. Um, the 34,000 potential uh, workers, um, um, is we could, we could actually double the amount of produce in the area because half of the area is lying fallow. Have a look at this. This is something that would make Vish happy. That Philippi horticultural area in the, in the middle there. Everything, um, virtually the whole city is within 10 kilometers of where we grow our food. And that makes, that's, that's going to make an incredible difference. Um, in the future, we are a drying province, and in particular, Cape Town is, uh, is becoming more and more desperate in terms of water supply because of the increasing population there as well. And the most amazing thing about that Philippi horticultural area is that we have an aquifer beneath it. So the, the aquifer underneath the Cape Flats, you see on the top left there, is actually 630 kilometers squared of aquifer water underneath, which is has more water in it than all the five dams above Cape Town combined. More water in it. And the deepest paleo channel is actually underneath the Philippi horticultural area. And part of that aquifer um, geology actually extends out into the ocean in the, in, in the False Bay area that you can see on the right there. And um, our area's produce went up 20% during the time of the drought, the three years of the drought, the rest of the province, they, productivity halved, the agricultural productivity halved. Um, and so the um, the scary thing about it, as Nazir mentioned in the video, is that this this bottom third has been bought up by developers and the, this 10-year process that we're talking about, Nazir Civic being involved in and ultimately the PHA campaign, um, has been to try and stop the whole due process that's going through in terms of approving those um, developments. One of the scariest things about that is that this blue suite, can you see this shadow here? This is the city of Cape Town's own map showing that the, the primary recharge zone of the Cape Flats aquifer, a whole lot of it is now under Mitchell's plan. The last unpaved area is under the southern portion of the PHA. And so what's proposed for the southern portion of the PHA? Buildings. Roofs and roads and pipes and drains and none of that is going to recharge the aquifer, so doesn't that look delightful? Mm -hmm. 40,000 houses, a private prison, two shopping centers, a light industrial area, and all of this. Um, in the top left-hand corner of the map, let me just quickly show you. Top left-hand corner, on top of the primary, uh, of the last giant wetland that's left, this one. There's a console sand mine that's been approved. One of the rezoning decisions, one of the rezoning reasons for allowing that area to be paved over is that the city said, well, that area is full of water for most of the year, so we can't actually, um, we, we can't actually put houses there, so we're going to let you um, put a console sand mine in. That's a 30 meter deep cut, which they will take out all the sand. There's no possibility of rehabilitating it because it's 50 hectares worth of sand cubic meters of silica sand that goes off and gets mel melted down to produce glass bottles. And that's the wetland that we're talking about. Um, how many species of birds in this year? They did a walk. 98 species. Yeah, the Bird Society um, walked up the road next to the area over one Saturday morning and identified 98 different bird species. Most of them are migratory birds. 
these migratory birds come and poop in the water mm. and produce the most unbelievably rich muddy brown soil which grows delicious vegetables for the rest of the year. So the farmers know that that area lies fallow over winter. Um, what is due process when you're turning um, agricultural land into urban development? You've got to go through, look at the, the list on the left there, is that you have to get permission from the National Department of Agriculture to subdivide the land. You've then got to shift the urban edge. There's an environmental impact assessment that has to be done. The city then um, processes a rezoning application, and in there amongst the mix is also a heritage impact assessment. And um, these are all supposed to be done by different departments. The, the, the top decision falls under the Department of Agriculture. Um, the next one is the, the Provincial Department of Development Planning. So they're all supposed to be checks and balances against each other. Um, but as it turns out in real life, there's a great deal more um, feeding into each other than is desirable. And this is what we've discovered. So we've been working our way through that due, due process. Despite the fact that there are, there have been seven studies from the PHA which recommend that the PHA be protected and managed as a horticultural area. The first official protection went in for the area in 1968 and it was declared as a horticultural area. And um, the <coughs> first developers put in their first application in 2009, um, there was a PHA rapid review study done a full city council then took that study and voted against allowing the development, but then it went up to the Provincial Department of Development Planning and that was MEC Bradell who then just changed the decision of the city council and said, okay, go ahead. So the contents of all these studies are very useful because once you go to court to take things on review, you have to have submitted um, empirically based facts. So, <coughs> This, this has been, uh, this hasn't been a happy experience. Maybe Nazir will tell you about the I'm angry call that he got from MEC Windy, who's the MEC for agriculture. Um, we were protesting about this agricultural study that was that was uh, went out to tender last year in April because we knew it was just um, a mechanism to allow the pave over of the PHA. The tender went out asking for a mixed use land plan on agriculture zoned land. Now, that's just unacceptable for an agriculture MEC to ask for a mixed-use land plan um, on agricultural land. It just shows, so they're, use, they're using that to, to change the spatial development framework as well. So these are all big words which I've had to learn as um, an active citizen. You learn along the way. We thought we only had to participate sort of finally in one of the environmental impact assessment uh, processes for that big development, the blue one. And actually, it turned out to be much, much worse than that. So there's some very interesting constitutional um, issues that have come up in this process. So the one of them relates to these two letters came from the National Department of Agriculture, one in 2009 and one in 2012. And the wording in these is absolutely beautiful. You don't get written, letters written as well as this um, these days. But the wording is stunning because it says, we have a mandate to fulfill. We have to deliver on food security. That's our constitutional mandate. We do not want you to pay this area over because we need this agriculture zone land to fulfill it. As well as that, there is a cultural history of agriculture in the area that needs to be retained as well. So heritage is not just finding archaeological diggings. Heritage is not just an old building, it can also be a cultural landscape because there is, a con there is a, an institutional memory that goes along with farming um, that has to be retained. It takes generations, especially in an area like on the, on the Cape Flats, it takes generations to learn how to, to farm that, that particular land with that particular weather. And so the constitutional issue that pops out of these two letters is the city is arguing we are the final authority. So, if the city wins that argument that we are the municipality, we get to make all the decisions about what happens in our municipal area, then you might as well not have any national laws. Yeah. You see, so there's a, there's a big cascade effect for all of the 
the, um, the battles that we are fighting. There's a cascade effect that, um, that applies to all of you. So I don't know how many of you saw the advert for, um, for the talk today. It's, it's what will your battle be? What will your fight be about? Because that's really what our democratic arrangement is about. How do you participate <coughs> in making decisions um, so that in, in the process of decision making, so that decisions are made in the interests of many? Because we might ask ourselves, why on earth is this happening? Why on earth is this happening? So I have this theory that the city of Cape Town is much more open to the sort of globalization influence and they are very much a Thatcherite government. So their definition of economic development is to have 30,000 houses. So that's construction, that's builders, that's banks who are handing out 30,000 bonds. That's economic development. Um, 40,000 jobs, that they've never proven that. They quoted that in their papers. We can't work out unless you have at least a maid or a gardener for every single one of the 40,000 houses that they're building. And to us, uh, weigh that up against everybody here. In, weigh that up against 4 million people in the city having food. Because as farmlands, and especially as organic farmlands, we can generate 55,000 jobs, and we do have the numbers to prove that. So there's this pension fund investment paradox where the developer bought the land in 2007 for 36 million rand. He went off and had um, the land re-evaluated if there would be an urban edge shift, and the evaluator came up with a, a value of 260 million. Um, another three years down the line, and the new evaluation was 890 million. So he persuaded some of the trade unions to invest 550 million in it. So in the last four years, we couldn't get any response from the ANC because Kosatu had invested this 550 million. So the developer bought the land for, for 36 million and then sold it to himself as the investment company using money from Kosatu for 550 million. And the balance of that is what they have been using against us since then in terms of the EIAs and all the legal processes. Um, when we go to a heritage hearing, there will be two advocates for the developer, that's 50,000 Rand a day. And then the Methodist and the Muslim sitting there arguing to retain the Lutheran heritage of the PHA. <laughs> and I am pleased to say that we won that heritage. Uh, that heritage. <laughs> but you know this development over Alice aspect in Cape Town, can you see the red carpet being rolled up there? Mm. And the flag going up, Fuck, this is a very noisy, um, uh, very noisy cartoon. It, this is from 2013. This development Uber Alice, let developers do anything that they want to, is so prevalent that you even have a cartoonist sure. giving us that analysis in 2013. Hey? And why is, that, why is that happening? Because parties have a, a five year window to, get, to make the most of being in charge. And the, the DA itself actually has had to expand exponentially in the, in the last five years. Remember, they've always been a very regional party. Now they've suddenly had to open up all over the country. Who donates the most money to the party? It's developers and it's big corporates. So developers buy the land, they build giant shopping centers, and the big corporates are happy as well. And then the banks are really happy handing out 30,000 bonds. So they're going to keep the party happy. And this would have happened, it didn't, it didn't matter who was in charge, this is how this, our system is working or not working, as the case may be. So this was the victory that we had, um, sitting in a room opposite two advocates. The one of them was my human rights advocate, my human rights lecturer from UCT. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to the committee, I said, Mr. Chairman, I would like to point out what my human rights lecturer at UCT <laughs> said, um, Advocate Pillay. She told us that human rights have to be balanced and that you can't delete the right to food and the right to water in the name of putting in housing. And we must note that those 40,000 houses are not low cost houses. It's, it's, it's high cost houses because they're, they're being built on land where the water table is a meter below the surface. You, you can't put low cost housing in unless it's more than six meters, preferably ten. So you're going to put a million and a half bucks of cement in first. How's that going to affect climate change? 
as well. Um, but these are, the, these are the sort of sentences that we managed to get from that tribunal, and these are what we will be using when we take those administrative decisions on review in court, you see. Getting this sort of wording generated is so important. Um, so the heritage significance of the PHA is inextricably linked to its agricultural function, and the relationship between the Cape Flats aquifer and the land and the city as a whole and climate change were found to be of critical importance. And so you see, this is even where your department comes into it because um, as in terms of amicus, we need to have friends of the court coming in and, and expanding on that link between retaining the land and climate change. And um, Prof Sacco is the, is the guy to do it for us. You know, So we need expert input on climate change, expert inco input on the retention, the role of the PHA in retaining food security for four million people in Cape Town, and what hasn't been um, what hasn't been developed very much, and especially in terms of law, is the right to land reform. And I think this, I came into the PHA campaign in terms of health and fresh vegetables and organic produce, because I'm a health economics person from public health. But I think I'm, my heart lies in the land reform side of things. Policy has stated that the PHA must be used, a third of the PHA must be handed over for land reform. So this is the health aspect, that the, the decrease in fresh vegetable consumption is, has led to a direct increase in diabetes and hypertension. So in South Africa that's been in 10 years from 3% of a diabetic prevalence to 10% diabetes prevalence. Imagine that in 10 years. It's going to be worse than HIV AIDS, eh? Worse than that because people cannot afford vegetables. Nazir has been selling cabbages. Well, Nazir doesn't sell to supermarkets anymore. But the, a cabbage in the PHA has been sold to supermarkets for the last 10 years for four rand. The price has not changed. What do you pay for a cabbage? between 20 and 30 rand. And, and, and we're understanding all these dynamics because a whole lot of that dynamic, part of it is, is money that has to go off to the shareholder. The other part of it is that pick and pay operates mostly as a transport company. They're making sure that you get, in Cape Town, you eat green peppers from the Mozambique side of the country. They make sure that in, um, in Louis Trichard, you eat um, a cauliflower that comes from the PHA. Because the transport, the cars, go, the, the trucks going up and down, that trucking business, is a giant part of that whole equation. And we really, I think we don't even understand a fraction of what's going on. So, so back to the land reform. The land reform element is so important because you are, apart from the fact that we've come from the 6% land reform product, Western Cape has managed to achieve <coughs> Um, handing over only 6% of their land in terms of land reform. Once you delete farmland, it's gone. And the members of the PHA campaign are organic farmers from all over the Cape Flats. So Karalitja, Makassa, and Fuleni, Kugaletu, they are organic trained vegetable farmers who are farming on plots of land like the one that we're putting in there at, um, at Sunnyside Res. And they can easily expand out to two hectares. And Nazir will tell you a bit more about the two hectare farming model that, that his farm is. So we're saying that on two hectares, instead of using 1,300 hectares of the PHA, that's the area that's been taken and been left fallow by developers, instead of using that 1,300 hectares and giving out 25 hectares or 50 hectares to farmers, we say give a family two hectares and you can put 500 small scale farmers. We can take those farmers from all over the Cape Flats who are capable of farming. They can scale up to two hectares and they can make almost a million bucks turnover a year on that two hectares. And, and that would be an amazing victory if we can generate a two hectare farming model um, that not only works in terms of, um, in, in terms of restitution, it's also going to work in terms of addressing climate change. And Nazir, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to come up and talk about peri-urban farming and the role that it plays and the importance that it will play in the future because 
we've got to start eating our food from our own backyard. We, we can't afford for Cape Tonians to be eating green peppers from Mozambique anymore. And we can't afford to be shipping food around the country. Um, and we can't afford to be paving over farmlands. We can't afford urban sprawl anymore. So, yeah, are you prepared to stand up, Ms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, just be five minutes. Yeah, Ms. has got this t-shirt, unfortunately it was in the laundry, it says I'd rather be farming. This one's good. That's generally. Thanks, Zeta. Um, thanks, Abish. Prof, Jane, Courtney, uh, thanks Food uh, Sovereignty Campaign, um, thanks Vince, and, um, and thanks for inviting us here. Um, we, I'm so happy to be here and take part in shaping that garden, and, uh, <clears throat> and we had a lot of fun with it. I didn't have a chance to change, so excuse the way I'm dressing. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a way of us from Cape Town also <clears throat> um, showing solidarity. Participate in the campaign here because um, the campaign is also showing showing solidarity with us down in Cape Town. <clears throat> so I'm happy to come here and share uh, what we're learning on the farm um, with the small scale farmers and food growers like we do in Cape Town. Um, I want to talk about small scale farming because there's this whole discourse happening at the moment in the country, uh, starting off at the high level presidential panel for land reform and agriculture. And in this discourse, there is this, there is two, um, there is two views. Uh, the one view is that land reform ought to go to commercial farmers. It ought to go to a select elite but, uh, farmer class who are commercially um, viable to farm and take and, 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 and replace or work with the existing value chains, supermarkets uh, and so on to develop this economic development narrative. And so we have been doing this for the last 10 years, start with Mbeki, in fact before that, um, and the government has, has focused its attention on developing a elite farmer class on the very same line as the BE. So we're now seeing the BE of our land. Right? Uh, and then the other view, uh, the other um, group of farmers in which I am in, are saying, no, we want land reform for small-scale farmers. Because we believe we are over 200,000 in, in the country, and the figure is, could possibly be double that. It's a very conservative figure out of class at, UCT, at UWC. And then if we give, give us little bits of land and the right support, we can contribute to not only food security, right, but we can contribute to, to addressing climate change in the way we are farming. Because most of these farmers are actually organic farmers. Mm -hmm. so, so we're having this, this tussle at the moment um, between uh, the elite black farmers and small scale farmers um, and one of the things that that the elite black farmers have have done is they've captured the imagination uh, of, of politicians because uh, you know if you're a farmer you need to have lots of land and you need to have a big tractor you need to have lots of uh, 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 resources available to be a to be a uh, to be considered uh, commercially uh, successful. But upon close examination, and this is from our understanding of what's happening in our area, because we have land reform principles in our area. If you take away the grants, the generous grants that these farmers are receiving year in, year out, from our tax money, if we take that grant away, boom, the whole farming business collapses. So it is not based on any sound business principles anyway, right? Uh, and so grants have become like what Zephaniah Piri, a farmer in Zimbabwe, says becomes, is like a hammock that makes farmers lazy. So we think that if the government applies proper support 
for small scale farmers, give them access to a little bit of land and the right resources and the right extension uh, servers and access to, to markets, that these farmers will, will do the job. So what we have at the moment is we have so much of white aging farmers and we have so much of black farmers, right? And the numbers that are crossed out of our area, you know, our area is the most studied area in the agricultural area in the whole country and possibly even the whole world. <laughs> Seriously, because what's happening is because they're trying to tell us we can pay this area over, generates a study and a study and a study and a study. And all those studies actually says, no, you can't pay it over. Right? Um, and out of these studies, we are seeing numbers that if we develop small scale farming and apply them in our peri urban areas, whether it's the city of Joburg, whether it's the city of Tswane, or whether it's in Klerksdorp or Fintersdorp or whatever village you are in town you are, if we apply small scale peri urban farming, we will create 500 farmers and they will generate 5 million jobs countrywide. And these are numbers just coming out of our area. We extract in these numbers. Farming has become the biggest problem in terms of our health, climate change, food insecurity, land degradation, but it's also the biggest solution for all those problems. Today we know that South Africa not only suffered apartheid and a holocaust on our people, but it also suffered a holocaust on our soil. And our soil has been classified as very degraded. It is a capitalist extractive farming system that, is, that has been employed on our land for over 100 years has now rendered our soils very degraded. Right? Our, our, farming, our farming system produces 40% of greenhouse, total greenhouse gas emissions. It uses 70% of our water. And, it's, and our farm laborers are the most marginalized workers in the country. Yet they produce our food that we're eating. And this is one of the biggest moral dilemmas, not only for farmers, the government, but also consumers, all of us who are eating food. It's a moral dilemma for all of us, right? We have to think about this. And then we also discovered through work, working and, and, and and, and talking to uh, 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 learned people uh, uh, and, and interacting with universities and research and so on, and, and also our own experience in the area that actually farmlands are not just a space where you produce food. Farmlands play multiple functions. Number one, they provide ecosystem services for your urban area. Now, there's a good illustration of one of the ecosystem services and bees. Our farm farmlands, when they are properly, properly uh, protected within biodiversity, um, the result of that will be that you will have bees. But if you take farms away, then you shouldn't have bees because the farmlands is actually the area where you have bees. Farmers use bees to pollinate crops. So you see what about what look like we have no bees. Right? And, CO and, and farmlands are also an area where you sink CO2. Plants need CO2 to grow. And the way now we are understanding how to produce food, we can even sink more CO2 by not tilling and apply some other methodologies that we are learning uh, and doing. A farm, after a farming area, it's also an area where you recycle nutrients. A cabbage leaves my farm, enters your house, you are consuming the waste from there all to come back onto the farm. What's happening now, we have, a, we have a system where, end of pipe system where all of the waste ends up in a landfill. Really, that needs to change and that is a way that farm lands can be used to regenerate um, um, your nutrients and recycle them. The farm, farmlands are also an area where you, you recharge your underground water. They are open spaces where rain dumps and recharges underground water. And, in, 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 and it's also an area where you can implement managed aquifer recharge. Managed aquifer recharge is where you use your underground water, 
right? You use it, I'm sorry, where you use your wastewater, you inject them into the, you clean them up using wetlands uh, and so on, and then you inject them into the underground. But you need space for this. And so the farmlands play that role as well. In our area, near to us, we have this beautiful illustration of how that works. You know, we have a water, you've heard about the Cape Town water crisis? Let me tell you, it's a water management crisis. It's not a water crisis. We've been saying this is one of the roles that our area can play to provide a city with 50% of its new water. The city has not listened to us, hasn't listened to their own officials, hasn't listened to their own to their academics. Oh, they will listen to the academics to give them the right arguments, of course, the captured ones. So this is happening in Atlantis, just an hour drive away from us, where the town of Atlantis, 100,000 people living there, they get the water from the underground aquifer, it gets cleaned up, they use the water, water, industry, in homes, the wastewater from there, the storm water gets combined, it gets filtered on in, in, in ponds, Talib is busy wanting to study that, and these ponds they clean with the, with the, with the plants, clean this water up, and then the water is moved into area where it's dumped into the soil. And then it reaches out to the aquifer and it gets taken out on the other side again as fresh water. Now this is, the, this is the role that our area can play, to provide the city with 30% of its water. Because around us we have three wastewater treatment plants where the city is spending millions of rands of energy and water, millions of liters of water every day, and they clean this water up and it gets dumped into the sea. End of pipe solution. Our area can close that loop. The other thing I want to share with you guys is there's this whole thing about agriculture feeds people. I want you, to, I want you guys to consider, consider this for a minute. Agriculture is mostly about commodities. Right? There are five or six commodities. It's, uh, it's wheat, it's corn. Most of these commodities are actually going into biofuels, in, 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 in producing in ethanol, uh, and producing um, um, in inputs for, 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 for junk food and so on. So the whole thing that agriculture feeds the world, we have to th rethink that now. Because actually our area has shown that it's actually horticulture that feeds the world. Mm -hmm. It's your fruits and vegetables, it's your, it's, your, it's, your, it's, your, it's your milk, it's your small animal proteins, it's your nuts. Okay? That is horticulture. And horticulture is what we eat every day. So I want us to think about that uh, when people talk about how agriculture is going to save the world. So here we have, um, okay, I'm going to skip this. So one of the things that we are learning on the farm is that it has never been a better time to be a revolutionary than being a farmer. <laughs> because the farmer holds a key to climate change. I'm sorry about you guys studying other things. <laughs> no, you're absolutely but there's right. a lot of bullshit jobs going around there, yeah. right? <laughs> and we have to think about how these jobs are actually going to make a difference in society. <coughs> Farming job, a farmer, can sequester most of your carbon by just, by just changing the land use management on the farm. And this is how we're doing it. So we have developed, through our learning and interaction with other farmers around us, we have developed the four principles of, of farming in an agroecological way. Uh, we actually, there's actually five. So we have developed this from 2017 to 2019 to a fifth principle. So there's no till, soil cover, diversity, living root. All of these are now understood to be key in capturing carbon and providing us with good food and building your biodiversity. And, and in our case in South Africa, is the decolonizing our agricultural landscape. We don't even know our landscape anymore. It has been colonized completely. The plants has been disappeared. Our bees have disappeared. I've just read a study the other day that 40% of, of, of our insects are under extinction list. 40% of our insects. And you know the insects in, under biodiversity plays a, plays a major role on our farm. 
Because we use beneficial insects to take care of the pests. That's why we don't spray pesticides. For every one pest, there's 1,600, 700 beneficial insects. That's how our Creator created the universe. We don't need to spray. All we need to understand how our natural system works. And agriculture is a study of our natural system and applied into our agricultural system. What's number five? Number five is we've discovered that actually we need to have animal integration in the farming system. If I'm a vegetable farmer, I have to have some animals on the in the system for to develop my soils and to recycle nutrients, get the compost from there and, and build proper soil. So actually I'm not really a vegetable farmer. I think I want to be called a soil farmer because everything we do is about the soil. So we concentrate just about how to build good soil and what we've been doing over the last few days is just to do that. We just concentrate on building soil. When we build soil properly, we then sequester carbon, we then um, uh, increase our biodiversity, we then produce good nutrient-dense food, and all of that without any help from chemical fertilizers and all of that. And I'm not the only one doing this, by the way. I'm not a genius. Our farmers in our area, well, we're, in the, in the, in the, we're engaging it. We're not geniuses. We're learning from other farmers. This system is applied on farms that are in 2,000 hectares. I'm sorry, 2,000 square, 2,000 acres. And as small as one acre. Mm. The same principles. You want to do some vegetable garden in your backyard? You use the same principle. Right? So there are farmers doing this successfully on 2,000 acres and one acre. And in my case, it'll be three acres. So, one day, my hero, Paul Kaiser, was asked when he was demonstrating his three-acre uh, uh, farm and he said, they asked him, but you know, Paul, you're making good money here on this three acres. You should be upscaling. And Paul said, and that's why I like his politics, he says, no, we shouldn't, I shouldn't be upscaling my, my farm. My farm workers are, my, my farm hands are getting paid double the rate of what everybody else is paying in the area. I'm making good decent income. Actually, we need hundreds of thousands of this size farms. Mm -hmm. Not this size farm, like a thousand hectares, a thousand acres of it. So farming and, and the way we think of farming can play a huge role in addressing all our critical issues that we're facing today. Hunger, joblessness, unemployment, livelihood uh, dysfunction, climate change, and the problem of CO2 in the, in the, in the atmosphere. And that's why I'm happy to be a farmer. So this is some photos of my journey to become a farmer. I got a grant from the, from the, from the Department of Agriculture in 26, and I wanted to become a bull farmer. Mm. I was, that was my model. I want to be a bull farmer because bull farmers look very successful, you see. They have a nice double cab, they have lovely big combines, tractors, they have a they have only house in Betty's Bay, and that's how I went to farm. Because they were my role models. And then my whole farming system collapsed because I'm not the, I'm not the bull farmer. Because I don't have that history of having two, three generations of farming history with knowledge and resources accumulated, by the way, a badly, by a badly accumulated, accumulated, uh, accumulated knowledge via apartheid system of whole government supporting you. But that aside, we can't do the same. Because we cannot be exploiting our farmers, our farm workers. We cannot be exploiting our environment. We don't even have enough land, right? Uh, so we, we were, as small scale farmers, we are, we are finding our feet in how we are addressing our, our land issues. And we will not allow the president of this country to tell, tell us that actually you small scale farmers are not commercial. What's commercial about the elite black farmers who get millions and millions of dollars of grant fund, funding, and if they take the funding away, their farming system collapses? What's commercial about that? This is just some of the farms, uh, some of my photos of the farm. We built a dam there, we put in cover crops. My, my land was so badly degraded. I only have a, a hectare. And only half of an hectare I'm farming on. That's all I have. And so my land was actually very, very, very badly degraded. We had to take out rubble, trucks and trucks of rubble out of my land. So I had to develop a whole system of understanding how to see the other soil. And we used it by, by, by using plants. And you see the seeds of those plants. A cover crop seeds. 
We turn that into that. That's my grandson. <laughs> so we turn a barren, rubble-infested land into a land where there's lots of life in the soil, worms and all of that, and bees, tons of bees. So much so that my neighbor put out three beehives. <laughs> this is our little beehive. And so I'm happy to hear that you guys are having a farmer's market here because I think from my experience when I was supplying picking paper pick pick tomatoes, I was producing a ton of tomatoes in the first two years of my career as a farmer. I didn't see any money. Pick and pay with all the money. Um, so I made me understand that actually as a small as a small scale farmer, that value chain is completely illogical for, for me. So now we're developing a farm alternative access to, to markets. We're developing different market streams. So, so now at the moment, we're selling our vegetables in a box, but we're also selling it off our street now, off the farm, at the farm gate, right? And we're going to increase doing that, and we eventually want, as we build capacity amongst our group of farmers on the Cape Flats, we eventually want to pilot one of these, like you guys are doing here. We're going to pilot one of these. Because you see, when a cabbage leaves, if a tomato, which I was growing, left my farm at four and a kilo, and my operating cost to produce a cabbage, that, that tomato, was six rand. Mm. And Pick and Pay was selling it for 13 rands a kilo. Mm. There was no way that a small farmer, even our existing medium-scale farmers, the white wood farmers, <laughs> even they are complaining. And the only way that they are still in business is because they expand the production. That's the only way they can stay in business. They expand production. You see less farmers, farmers collapsing, but those more resource farmers are expanding their operations. And that's the only way that they can make money. So to change that is not really about, about productivity, because they love to talk about productivity. I'm so productive, I have like tons of, uh, 20 tons of cabbage per acre. Right? It's not really about the yield and ton per acre. It's about income. Mm -hmm. So if I can get 10 rand for my cabbage, I don't have to have hundreds and hundreds of hectares of cabbages. See? So it's about not about, about tons per hectare, but rather income. What is your selling price? And now we're selling cabbages for 10 rand. The consumer is paying almost 10 rands cheaper than pick and pay is cabbage. And I'm getting double what I'm, what I'm getting if I, pay, if I sell to pick and pay. And it's organic. And it's organic. <laughs> so we believe that our food must be priced in a way that our local community can access them and can eat from them. So one of the things that farmers the roles of farmers play is also that we also we have to reverse urban sprawl, you know, and um, and part of this whole all this, the whole narrative of what farms what role farms play is about actually nutrition greening the landscape. I just made this up. Sorry. <laughs> I just made this up. But we have to have shrubs and trees and this and that and that. But I'm saying, but hang on, the one element that's missing there and so off is, is actually food. We should be we should be planting food with our shrubs and our trees and all this thing. It's a complete system. You cannot just take shrubs and trees and not not putting food in there because that's how nature works. So in our farm at uh, here at the sunny side, we're planting not only food. We're planting. Shrubs, indigenous shrubs, ground covers, trees. Because they're the habitat for your local species. Insects, your bees, your pollinators. And they help assist us, the farmers, in doing their job well. And we're blooming the landscape. A farmland is actually a place where water is captured in soil. So we blues the landscape. And I think I've spoken enough. I think, Susanna, you want to just finish up with this? And I'm, I just want to say I'm very, very happy to be here and, and help, um, help with the farm. And hopefully, 
um, you know, the farming, the, 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 the vision that you guys have will grow from strength to strength. And I think the first one or two is always the most difficult sure. ones. Sure. Maybe we'll learn all kinds of lessons. Mm -hmm. And so what happens with us as farmers, you know, the first couple of years of farming is horrible. <laughs> you know, you learn so many lessons, you make so many mistakes, but eventually you start to learn from that. You know, one of my other big heroes is Gabe Brown. And he says, if I don't get up in the morning, I make one mistake. There's something wrong. I'm not learning anything. Yes. So that's my motto as well. I'm always sad when his ear stops talking. Because <laughs> he's the lunatic who comes up with things like gluing the landscape and green, greening the landscape. I have enjoyed volunteering for the PHA campaign because I love a good struggle. It's a very interesting time that we live in. It's 25 years after our democratic revolution. I have to say that the main reason I ended up joining the campaign was because I asked myself why did Zuma come to power and how did he end up messing things up so richly? It was my fault. All us happy middle class people went off and lived our lives. We ran around, I ran around blowing up railway lines in my early 20s, it was great fun. There were some, some uh, more death, uh, the horrible side of things wasn't great fun. Um, but we went off and raised our children, and that's what happened. Um, so, do you remember the name of Nazir's farm? Who remembers the name of Nazir's farm? Vegetable. Okay, so I've got Vegkop and Fachkop. <laughs> and and this, is, this is who we are. We're all veg cops by now. We're all conscious and we're all aware. And we have a lot of American and overseas visitors who come for lectures and we all explain that this means vegetable head. Mm. We don't always explain this means the fighting head. And this is really what is required of all of us. We're all going to have to fight for, in, in as much as fighting against the developers is fighting against, you've got to work out what you're going to be fighting for. Um, Justice is for the rich, unfortunately, and our constitutional rights are available to those who have money. One of the amendments that we wrote in and suggested for the um, um, expropriation bill was to put a clause into section 25 that puts the onus on the landowner to prove that their land use is just and equitable. So if you are a property owner, you've got all these beautiful rights in the first two paragraphs of section 25 which say that you have the right to this property and it can't be taken away from you randomly. Well, what then happens under all these constitutional, under all the Bill of Rights things, we had it in health, super money versus the state. Super money was a patient in Durban who, wanted, who, who, who needed a kidney transplant and he took the state to court for not giving him a kidney transplant. He had to go and find the resources while he was dying to take the state to court to force them to give him a kidney transplant. I won't get into the outcome of that ruling, but it had to be provided within the resources that were available by the state. But why is it always the poor person who has to go and get a judge? Why, is it, why, is it, why do the people without resources have to find a million bucks to go to a judge? to get them to make a just ruling. That's where the PHA campaign is. We don't have any money. In fact, if we lose this case, Nazir loses the farm because that's the only way it's been, we can do it. Is that if we, get, if we lose the case, costs will be awarded against us and then we will pay for 12 different advocates who are against us. Two or three from the city of Cape Town, from the province, and from two developers. That's 12 against one little contingency junior advocate who's managed to fit us in. So know your constitution. Section 34 of the constitution says you have the right to a fair hearing on any administrative decision. So we're submitting that to the pub public protector. We want the public protector to tell us whether it's fair that we have one little advocate versus 12 on that side. Now the other element of that was that we, we cited all the other government departments, we, we cited nine different government departments as co-respondents. They could all have come on board. Cooperative governance, water, Department of Agriculture, they could all have come on board and brought their resources with them to defend the farmland. 
Not a peep. Not a peep from any of them. They're too busy having factional battles. Persistence is everything. Um, and so are the people who are delivered to our lives. People like Andrew Benny and um, Sharon West. You know, people pop up on Facebook. And, and Vishwas, you've become such valuable resources to us in our battle. There are always resources that are invaluable. And that was the title of our talk today, The Value of Nothing. The price of the land is immeasurable. The price of, of putting together this battle has also been immeasurable. We have grown immeasurably in the last four years. We've also gotten a lot more gray hair. Um, eventually you will be heard. Your just cause will prevail. Um, you know, one of the definitions of corruption that we work to is where administrative decisions are being made in the interests of a few to the detriment of many. And our cause is very easy to, to, to summarize. The interests of a couple of developers are being pursued over every single angle that we try to take to persuade them that it's not in the interests of four million Cape Tonians. Be it climate change, land reform, water security, food security, the interests of two developers would prevail unless people like you and people like me come along and try to restore some sort of balance. So we'll have a good struggle, and that's where we are at the moment. Um, and we hope, we, love, we come up with, with, with lovely little um, epithets to persuade ourselves that we want to wake up in the morning. Some mornings I wake up and I think, why can't somebody else go and say what this reworking of the concept of democracy. You've got amazing minds in your midst who are also reworking that in the context of climate change and food security. And, um, and I think that the work that we're doing is contributing in that regard. And, and if we all get that point, there's a, an amazing future available to us in South Africa. Because who else in this world really has gotten to live history? I mean, that's what we've been doing for the last 30, 40 years, is living history. It's a great privilege. Thank you, Richard.